Amen. 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 Welcome to uh, House uh, 633. It is such a pleasure, such an honor to uh, be able to be with you guys here today. Um, I'm grateful for everybody that is here. I'm praying for all of those that are not here, but I'm not praying for them because they're not here. I'm praying for them because I know that there are circumstances in life that something doesn't allow you to do um, what you want to do. So we pray for them and we thank God for their lives. Uh, and also, uh, I, I'm thankful to God for everybody that is watching through social media. Uh, I really uh, enjoy the season that we're in simply because um, uh, it allows us to, to be able to, uh, to stream and to be able to reach people that normally we wouldn't be able to reach. So we thank God uh, for technology. We thank God for this means uh, because it allows us to be able to reach people that aren't able to make it here physically, either because they're in another country, another state, or simply another city, uh, or just simply they, they got other things going on that does not allow them to be able to make it. So, uh, you know, social media allows us to be able to still be able to reach people uh, with the, uh, the message of the kingdom, with the word of God, and still be able to help them change and be transformed from wherever location uh, they may be in. So today we're, we're going to be talking about light in the darkness. We're going to continue down uh, this uh, message series. And I, and I want uh, uh, everybody, I want to talk about another aspect of light. I know that we've been, we've been talking that uh, in the light shines in the darkness and the darkness is not comprehended. And we've been talking about that light is revelation, is knowledge that allows us to be able to be transformed. Uh, we've been also talking that darkness is ignorance. Uh, and, and it is uh, basically something that does, does not allow us to understand the light. So, you know, another thing that we've been talking about is that whatever the revelation light exposes, it also corrects and everything that reveals uh, truth is light to the soul. So we've been endeavoring in those things in the last couple of messages. But today I'm going to talk about a, a, a different aspect of, of light because uh, uh, we want to be able to progress in our growth and in our, in our, our maturity and, in our, and, be, and we want to be able to advance. Um, and I want to be able to uh, take you guys to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 43. We're going to read it, we're going to, we're going to do a prayer, and then we're going to dive deep in, into uh, the, the Word of God. Um, and this is what it says, Matthew 5, 43. Your ancestors have also been taught, love your neighbors and hate the one who hates you. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just want to be able to come before you today, Father. Be able to come to your throne, Father, and just ask you to open up our minds, to open up our hearts, to make us teachable, Father. Uh, so that everything that is spoken out of your word here today, Lord, might be revelation light to us that is going to allow us to be transformed and be able to radiate who you are, Father. We want to be able to be just like you, Father, and be able to understand things uh, to a, such a level that is going to cause transformation, that is going to cause ignorance to be broken, that cause ignorance to be permanently um, released from our lives, Father. So in the name of Jesus, I pray for the ones that are here. I pray for those that are listening online, Father, that your word might shine in the darkness. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. So... I wanted to uh, continue down this path about uh, talking about light. And I wanted to uh, take us to, to this uh, uh, revelation here in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 43. So if you guys have your Bibles, you guys have your Bibles up at home. Uh, if you guys uh, um, have a, a notepad in your, uh, in your phone or you have a physical notepad, I encourage everybody present and everybody that is online to... Uh, to be teachable, meaning take notes. Because when you come without taking notes, it, it, it basically kind of reveals, like, I already know something, or you don't care about something. So when you take notes, uh, and not only does it allow you to grow, it allows you to, to go back later on and reread some certain things that, that you forget. Because that's what happens. You, you get a revelation, you get some information, you're like, oh, man, I got it. And then you go home, I forgot it. <laughs> 
and, and then you go back to, to, to a state where God is trying to release you from. So we, we want, we're talking about light, and light, like I said, light is basically revelation. Revelation is not something new. Revelation uh, is something that is hidden in plain sight, but that is viewed in. So when God comes he, and he gives you revelation, the only thing that he is doing is basically removing the veil to show you something that has been present, but you have not been able to see. So revelation is what's needed in order for us to be able uh, to live out the kingdom life or be able to live out uh, the principles and the standards of Jesus Christ. And I wanted, to, I wanted to go through this book of Matthew today, chapter 5, verse 23, and I'm going to read a couple of verses and I'm going to kind of like break them down a little bit so that we can get some revelation. Because uh, in, 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 in this passage, Jesus Christ is talking uh, uh, to the multitudes and to his disciples. And he was teaching them about uh, knowledge. And he was te teaching them about information that they already had. But he wanted to give them revelation. So he told them, hey, your ancestors have also been taught. Love your neighbors and hate the ones that hate you. Uh, in the law, it was written, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you know. And, and he was saying, however, I say to you, love your enemy, bless the, bless the one who curses you, do something wonderful for the one who hates you, and respond to the very ones who persecute, persecute you by praying for them. Mm. I want to stop right there. And I'm going to keep on going down here, but, but I want us to be able to understand what revelation really does. What happens when God opens up our minds? What happens when God opens up the scripture? Because they had been taught to love their neighbors and to hate the people that hated them. Meaning that, that they were only to love the ones that loved them back, but the people that wished them harm, uh, they were supposed to hate and curse and defend themselves against. But when Jesus Christ started coming down to the earth, he came with the revelation of the kingdom. He came with the revelation of the standards of how everything operated in the invisible realm. He came not to live under the standards of the earth. He came so that we can live under the standards of heaven. And in the standards of heaven, uh, the law is applied a little bit different. On the earth, the law was applied, or the revelation, or the knowledge was applied. Love your neighbors and hate the one that hates you. However, he says, in the kingdom, it's a little bit different. In the kingdom, I say to you, I'm going to bring you the revelation. You love your enemies. In the kingdom, you bless the ones that curse you. In the kingdom, you do something wonderful for those who hate you. And you respond to the very ones who persecute you by praying for them. Hmm. That is light. That is revelation. Why? Because revelation allows us to live the lifestyle of a true son. The lifestyle of a true citizen. The lifestyle of heaven here on the earth. Uh, as we continue reading... It says here in Matthew 5.45, For that will reveal your identity as children of your heavenly Father. He is kind to all by bringing the sunrise and to warmth and the rainfall to refresh, whether a person does what is good or whether it's evil. So it says that uh, you're, you're going to be revealed. Your identity is going to be revealed because your identity might be viewed into people. Your identity, even though you're present, uh, might be yielded to them simply because of how you behave, simply by the way that you interact with them. So it says that if you're a child of God, your your identity is going to be revealed by the for the by the people that don't know you simply by how you behave with them, simply by the things that you do with them. And he comes in and he says here in verse 45. For that will reveal your identity as children of your heavenly Father. And then he revealed the identity of our Father. Simply here, he's not even revealing technically your personal identity. He's revealing the identity of our Father. And he says that our Father, he is kind to all. Our Father is kind to all. By bringing the sunrise to warm and rainfall to refresh whether a person does what is good or evil. Meaning that our Father, our Father loves everyone, and, the, and our Father is kind to everyone, and our Father gives the rainfall to every 
everyone, and our Father brings out the Son to everyone. Our Father is kind and loving. As a matter of fact, our Father is love. And because He is love, He gives He gives freely to everybody, not, not uh, caring whether they even believe in Him or not. And then He continues saying, What reward do you deserve if you only love the lovable? Don't even the tax collectors do that. How are you any different from others if you limit your kindness only to your friends? Don't even the ungodly do that? Since you are children of a perfect Father in heaven, you are to be perfect just like Him. So when, when Christ comes and He starts to give us the revelation, and, and like I said, when we go back to the, to the book of John chapter 1 verse 5, He says, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then we come back to chapter 5 of Matthew. He's telling us how the light operates in real time. The, when you have light, when you have revelation, when, when it has been revealed who your father is, and when it has been revealed that you're supposed to be just like your father, then it tells you what, what is the behavior of those that have revelation. It tells us what is the behavior of those that, that identify or are followers of Christ and are Christ's life. Everybody that has had the revelation of Christ, and they love their enemies. They bless the people that curse them. They do something wonderful for the people that hate them. And they respond to the very ones that persecute them by praying to them. Now the question is, how do we treat the people that curse us? How do we treat our enemies? How do we treat the people that tell us that they hate us? How do we respond to the people that persecute us? Because that will get, that is going to reveal if we are children of God or not. Because the next verse says, For that will reveal your, your identity as children of your Heavenly Father. He is kind to all. So if, if your Father is kind to all, and you say that he is your father, we're going to reveal your identity by watching you in action and how you react to the people that treat you bad. How do you react to the, to the people that don't love you? How do you react to the people who curse you? How do you react to the, to the person that is persecuting you? How do you react? That is going to reveal your true identity. Because everybody says, I am a son of God. But the moment you're, you, you face persecution, you tell them, Father, let lightning fall from heaven and strike this person. Father, I pray that they die so that they no longer can, uh, can harm me. Father, I ask you to remove them from my life. Is that what Jesus did? <laughs> As a matter of fact, they remind me of a story uh, when he was walking with, with his disciples and he entered a certain town. And then when he reached that town, uh, the people of the town came out. He didn't, wasn't even allowed to go into the town. The people of the town came out and they said, Jesus, we don't want you here. We don't want you entering our town. We don't want nothing to do with you. Leave. And then Jesus said, I'm going to pray so that my father can destroy you. No, you know what Jesus did? He says, amen, you guys don't want me here, I will leave. And he walked away. But what is surprising is that the story says that two of his disciples, two brothers came to him and said, Lord, do you want us to pray so that fire can descend from heaven and consume them? Terrorism. Religious zealots. And then Jesus Christ comes and he says to them, you guys don't even know what spirit is guiding you. You guys don't even know what spirit is in you. Because I did not come to destroy. That is not my spirit. I did not come to, to, so that people can perish. I came to save people. Now, the same word, you know, we were reading in, in these last couple of weeks. It was saying that even though God doesn't judge people, he allows people to judge themselves. Right. So he says that the light shined in the darkness and the darkness didn't comprehend it. 
But those that comprehended the light made a decision to be in the light so that everybody can see that what they were doing were, was fruitfulness from God or were the deeds of God. They, they didn't hide. But the people that loved their evil de deeds, they wanted to maintain in the darkness and they wanted to conceal how evil they were. And that is the judgment that was against them, that they loved the darkness more than they loved the light. So Jesus, when he walked into this town, even though he came to this town to save it, the people of the town wanted no part of Jesus. And he, they didn't want to change it. They didn't want to be transformed. But Jesus did not condemn them. Jesus allowed them to condemn themselves. So he's telling his disciples, Hey, the fact that you're asking me if you should pray for the destruction reveals to me that you are being led by the wrong spirit. So there are a lot of people that are walking with Jesus, that are following Jesus in the wrong spirit. Not with the revelation of who Jesus Christ is, not with the revelation of who the Father is, not with the revelation of what the Holy Spirit is, but with knowledge and anger and hate hidden in their heart. And all they needed was to be exposed to that so that that can come out. That's what Jesus Christ was telling them in Matthew. You have been taught love your neighbors and hate the one that hates you. But I tell you, you have to love your enemies. You have to bless the ones that curse you. Uh, do something wonderful for the ones that hate you. And respond to the very ones that persecute you with prayer. So we look at the life of Jesus Christ and we look how he conducted himself. We see that he was handed over to the priest. We see that he was handed over to the re religious elite, to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, to the teachers of the law. We see that they spat on his face and they humiliated him. We see that they whipped him and we see that they crucified him. And when he was in the cross, it was revealed that he understood who his father was. And, he, and it was revealed that he was really a son of God. Why? Because when he was up in the cross, he did not pray for the angels to come and destroy the multitudes. As a matter of fact, his prayer was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgive them because they are still in darkness. Forgive them because they are ignorant. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing and that's why they're doing the things that they're doing to me. So I have always told people that are around me that in our ministry, in our calling, uh, we were called to understand people. But people didn't necessarily have to understand us. So even though people want to harm us, we will not pay them back with the same coin. Even though people hate us, we were not going to treat them the same way. Even though people want to persecute us, we will continue to pray for them. Because we, were, we, because we have the revelation, because we have the knowledge and the understanding, because we know who our Father is, now we can be able to pray and ask our Father to forgive people for the things that they do. So revelation or the light uh, exposes us in our behavior. It exposes us in our action. It exposes us and it reveals if we're still in darkness. Because going back to this story, like I said, the, the two brothers came to Jesus and said, hey, we're going to pray and we're going to pray that there are, that brimstone and fire comes and it consumes this people and it destroys this town because they want nothing to do with you, Jesus. When we don't have revelation, when we don't have the, when it is not opened up by God to us, we will become religious zealots that will destroy the lives of people in the name of God. We will become spiritual terrorists wanting the destruction of people in the name of God. Instead of bringing restoration, instead of bringing healing, Instead of bringing people and carrying them in their weakness, we will, we will step on them and we will curse them and we will attack them because we, it is because we have the wrong spirit. So how does the light work? The light is only there to expose the darkness. The light is there to expose our behavior. 
our attitude, the things that we do. And that is what makes what makes the kingdom so complicated for people. And that is what makes this message so complicated because people are full of information, but they have no light. Mm. People are full of knowledge, but nothing has been unveiled. So they continue to hate and preach a God of love. They continue to say that God is a God of restoration and their life is not restored. They continue to say uh, that, that, that God um, it is a God that can do anything, but it's not visible in their life. And so people want nothing to do with the, with the church. People want nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with Christ because there are people that come to Christ, but never get the revelation. It, it comes to my mind uh, when Philip was, was walking through, 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 through the road, and he bumped into this eunuch, this uh, Ethiopian, and he was reading uh, the manuscript of Isaiah, and then he asked him a question. Do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what it says here? And then the, the eunuch, the Ethiopian, asked him the question, but how can I understand if nobody explains it to me? How can I understand if nobody comes here and gives me the revelation of what this means? And then Philip walks into the carriage and then give, opens up the scripture to him and gives him the revelation of what Isaiah was speaking about. Because his question was, is it talking about the Messiah or is it talking, who is it talking about? Is it the prophet or is it the Messiah? Who, who, what is this passage all about? He had the knowledge, he had the information, he was reading it, but he didn't have the revelation. And, and, and he needed somebody to open it up for him in order for him to understand it. So most of the time, we are able to, to come to Christ and bring people to Christ because we ourselves don't have a revelation. We just have we just have Bible verses. We tell people, love your wives because God loves marriages. And then we teach people on marriage, and then they come to find out that I'm divorcing my wife. Let me continue reading. <laughs> Second Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Now it's because of God's mercy that we have been entrusted with the privilege of this new covenant ministry, and we will not quit or faint uh, with weariness. We reject every shameful cover-up and refuse to resort to cunning trickery or distortion. Uh, or distorting the word of God, instead we open up our souls uh, to you by, by presenting the truth to everyone's conscience in the sight of, pre uh, of in the sight and presence of God. Even if our gospel message is viewed, it is only viewed for those that are perishing. For their minds have been blinded by the God of this age, leaving them in unbelief, their blindness keeps them from seeing the day spring light of the wonderful news of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the divine image of God. We don't preach ourselves, but rather the lordship of Jesus Christ, for we, for we are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let the brilliant light shine out of darkness, is the one who has cascaded his light into us, the brilliant dawning light of the glorious knowledge of God as we gaze into the face of Jesus Christ. Mm. When light comes into our life, when God comes and he unveils something to us, is so that we can be able to demonstrate the lifestyle of heaven to the people here on earth. 
We were not given information to pass on information. We were given revelation so that we can break down the word so that other people can live it out as well. We were, we, we were light in the darkness. Mm. John 3, uh, 19 says these words. Watch, you know what? I'm going to skip that. I'm going to go. Uh, mm. Let me go here. Matthew 5, 13. And this, is, and this is the reason why God comes and he gives us revelation and he, and he opens up the word for us. And I want us to understand this. Matthew 5.13 Your lives are like salt among the people. But if you like salt become bland, how can your saltiness be restored? Flavorless salt is good for nothing and will be thrown out and trampled by others. When God comes and he gives us revelation, he opens up the Bible and he shows us things that other people can't see, it is not so that we can believe that we're better than other people, it is so that we can be effective as salt. Because if we lose our salt and we become bland and we lose our flavor, and then the Bible says that the only thing that we're good for now is to be thrown out and to be trampled on. How can somebody listen to somebody that lives a lifestyle of adultery? How can somebody listen to somebody that lives a lifestyle of fornication? How can somebody listen to somebody that lives a lifestyle of lying? How can somebody listen to somebody... That, that is a thief, that is prideful, that is arrogant. How can somebody listen to somebody that doesn't care for their family? How can somebody uh, have knowledge of God, yet not, have any, not be the salt? And that's why he said that he comes and he gives us the revelation. Why? Because our lives are to be like salt among the people. We are supposed to be able to live uh, and be the lights that people are supposed to look at so that their lifestyle can be changed. That's what it says. But if you, like salt, become bland, how can your saltiness be restored? How? And, and this is the key. And, and, and I, I'm going to probably talk about this a, a couple of minutes here because I, I want to mark the difference based on this passage here, and I hope that we get some revelations of understanding, because there is a difference between somebody that doesn't know Christ and is coming to Christ for the very first time, and Christ forgives his sins. There are many people that have never had an encounter with Christ, and we are presenting Christ and, and they are living a lifestyle of sin. They are living a lifestyle of darkness. They are living a lifestyle separated from God. Simply because they don't know who Christ is. So we come and we present to them Christ. And they say, hey, I have seen the light. I have seen that I live in darkness. And I want to form part of the light. And they come and they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Jesus welcomes them into the kingdom. And, 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 and he starts the process of... of, 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 of um, of salvation and, 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 and removing them from oppression so that they can be free and removes all of their sin and removes all of these things from their life and, 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 and he protects them because they're still babies in the faith. So that is one group of people. I want to talk about the other group of people because it says your lives are supposed to be like salt among the people. The people that are supposed to be salt are the ones that have already been restored by God, are the ones that have already been salvaged to the point where they are now ready to be sold and be, and be sent into the world to be able to save other people. These are the Christians that have been in church for five years. These are the Christians that have been in church for 10 years. These are the ones that have been in church for 15 years. And these are, these are the guys uh, that God is talking to, and, and he says to them, but if you, like salt, become bland, what is it to become bland? When you uh, uh, are uh, backslide, you came into the light, you were rescued by God, He cleansed you by His blood, He removed all your sins, now you're a saint, now you're holy in His presence, now you're righteous, and now you're walking with God, and all of a sudden, you made a decision to say, you know what, 
I know that God saved me. I know that God did all this stuff for me. But I'm going to make the decision that I'm going to go back and live the lifestyle that I did before. So I'm going to go hook up with, with the girl in the choir. I'm going to go to the club. I'm going to go drink. I'm going to go do all these things uh, that are going to contaminate and cause me to be impure and unholy before God. And then God says, but if you like salt become bland, if you like salt decide to backslide, because backsliding is a choice. Mm. How can your saltiness be restored? And I want to open it up for you guys. Because the only way that you can be restored is if you're under authority. The only way that you're going to be able to be restored is if you have somebody there as a spiritual figure above you and you're under authority because he's the only one that can restore you back. There are a lot of people that, that are still living a lifestyle that they, in their mind and their heart they have a desire. Then they're asking God, God, restore me. God, uh, uh, take me back. God, give me back my saltiness. How can it be restored? How can the saltiness be restored? How can I restore broken character? But there's a problem. The problem is that this individual, these people have nobody that they're accountable to. These people have nobody that they can go and confess their sin to. These people have nobody that, that is a spiritual authority over them that can restore them back into their position. So Christ is coming and he's saying there, that your lives are to be like salt when you're among the people. But if you, like salt, decide to become blind or become blind because you decide to go do things that separate from you, how can your saltiness be restored? Flavorless salt is good for nothing and, and will be thrown out and trampled on by others. If you don't have somebody to restore you, you don't, you don't have no saltiness. Meaning there's no character. There's no, how can your broken character be restored? And how can you come back and do the things that God has called you to do if there is nobody there to put you back, to restore you? Who is your authority? So you spend the next 5, 10, 15 years with the knowledge of Christ coming to church, singing in the choir, doing all of these things. But you're flavorless. There's no salt in you. And it says that saltiness, uh, something that has no salt or is flavor is good for nothing and it's ready to be thrown out and be trampled on by others. So I ask the people that are living out there that have been Christians for 50, 20 years or have been walking with God long enough, are people listening to you or are people not listening to you simply because they know what you've done? They know your life and your life has no saltiness. So they only trample on it. They walk all over it. They have no weight. It has no power. Simply because they know your trajectory. But most importantly, simply because you refuse to come under authority. Simply because you refuse to be able to put yourself back in a place where you can be restored. You live, your lives are like salt among the people. But if you like salt become bland, how can your saltiness be restored? Flavorless salt is good for nothing and it will be thrown out and trampled on by others. It is, it is with great sadness to me to see how many people are not willing to listen to the message of the kingdom or to the gospel simply because the person that is speaking is flavorless salt. Simply because they won't receive it. Simply because of the person who's speaking. That is what Christ is talking about here. They're, they're full of knowledge. But they're good for nothing. People trample over it. Simply because they're not worth following. They're not worth being heard. So Christ is saying, once I have saved you and, and I have made you like salt... 
make sure that you stay the soul because if you make a decision to go back and, and backslide and you become blind, how are you going to be able to be restored? How can the saltiness be given back to you if you have no authority? Which brings me to, to the next thing of how many people I have spoken to that have left the church, have left different churches, and the first question that I ask them is, who's your authority? Christ is my authority. Then die and go to heaven and ask him for help. Because you have to have an authority on the earth. Who's your authority here? Who's your pastor? Who's your spiritual father? Who is your mentor? Who is it that you go to for restoration? Oh, I don't need that. Then you're going to spend the next 40 days in the desert and you're going to die in the desert. Because there's no salt. How can we restore the salt? The flavor? How can we give people back what they've lost if they still refuse to be in disobedience by not being under authority? So the light comes so that we can, so they can be exposed to us, so that we can understand that when God saved us and made us salt, uh, it was so that we can maintain the saltiness uh, in His presence. But if we ever make a mistake, if we ever step out of His grace, if we ever do something that we get separated from Him, He's asking us a question now: How can you become the salt again? How can you, your saltiness be restored? How? If you have no authority. If you have nobody that holds you accountable. If you have nobody to put you back. You see this bottle here? It's in its place, right? If it falls, it's not going to pick itself up. Somebody has to pick it up. Mm, that's good. Somebody has to get it from there back to where it belongs. Right. Where it knows it goes. Mm. This bottle can't do it by itself. Mm. Somebody has to look, hey, look, this thing is out of place. This thing fell. Because it was supposed to be there. It fell. Somebody has to take the time to pick it up, grab it, and put it back in its place. Restore it. That's really good. Who's doing that for you? Who's walking with you and restoring your character? Restoring you back to the place that God wants to restore you to? Nobody. I, I'm reading the Bible all by myself. And I'm going to submit to the authority of Christ. And Christ is saying you're outside of order. Mm. Mm -hmm. even, our, even our King, even Jesus Christ, they asked him a question. And if the question was by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because they believed that they were the only ones that had the ability to invest people with authority. Right. Oh. We are the ruling elites. We are the religious, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. Everybody that has authority has authority because we gave it to them. So they came and they asked Jesus this question. We see the things that you are doing. But I have a question. By what authority are you doing this? They didn't deny his power. They asked him what authority he was doing. This. And I love Jesus because Jesus, Jesus answered them with a question the same way that, that they were questioning him. And they told him, okay, I will tell you where I got my authority. But first you have to answer my question. Was the message of John the Baptist from men or was it from God? And then you read the story, and the story reads that they say, well, they huddle together. Man, if we say that the, that, that the message of John uh, or the authority of John came from the people, uh, then the people are going to hate us, and they're going to destroy us. If we tell them, actually it's the other way around, if we tell them that, the, that the, the, the authority of John is not from God, the people are going to destroy us because they know that John was sent by God. 
So Jesus, we don't know where John got his authority. And Jesus came back and says, well, since you don't recognize my authority, I ain't going to tell you where I got this authority. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus, when we study the gospel, when we study the Bible, his authority was transferred to him by John. It wasn't God. I know that this is going to bring conflict to the life of people. Because we have the misconception that God is sovereign. But that's because we have a misconception of what sovereignty means. Sovereignty means, simply means uh, that somebody is in full control of himself and that he is, in, he is outside of the influence of any other government. So God is sovereign because he's not under the influence of any other government but his own. But in his sovereignty, he decided to give uh, authority to man. So in order for Christ to legally have authority on the earth, he needed to receive it from somebody that was authorized to wield it. So he had to go to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist transferred authority to Jesus Christ so that he can go out and do his ministry. Now, Jesus Christ, once he became the light, and once he became the salt of the earth, he never backslided. He kept the saltiness, so he never needed to be restored. But he left something in place for all of us. Now, it is not the will of God for us to backslide or for us to commit a sin, but he has left an open door there in case somebody wants to do something like that. He says, who's your authority? Because you are answerable to your authority. If you ha don't have an authority, who are you going to answer to? And I know many people might say, Jesus didn't answer to nobody. You need to read your Bible. Because Jesus was preaching one day, and John was in jail. And John got his disciples, and, they, and he told them, I want you to go where Jesus is at, and I want you to ask him a question. Because everybody was questioning Jesus, and Jesus was saying, I don't need to answer nothing to you guys because you guys are not my authority. I don't owe you guys an explanation to nothing. But the disciples of John showed up, and then they came and they said, Teacher, we come on behalf of John, and John has a question. He's asking, are you the Messiah, or are we supposed to wait for someone else? What did Jesus say? I ain't going to answer John. Who is John? You know what, he, know what Jesus says? Go back to John and tell John and tell him what you see. The lame walk. The blind see. The leopards are healed. The captives are being let free. I am the one. Go tell him. He answered his authority. Ain't nobody, nobody out here can operate outside of authority. It's impossible. So Jesus Christ comes and he comes and he gives us a revelation. If we want to be the salt, make sure that we don't backslide. But if we backslide, how are we going to be restored? How are we going to get our saltiness back if there is nobody that is above us? Then there is nobody that can put us back. If there is nobody there, then it says that the only thing that you're good for is simply to be thrown out and to be trampled on. So now let's look at the lives of all of these people that have no authority. All of these people that don't believe in authority. Right. All of these people that believe that their only authority is God. Mm. Or Christ. They have no pastor. They have nobody over them, no spiritual father, nothing. Just look at their lives. It's a mess. Because unless you're willing to come under authority, you can't be un you can't have authority over nothing. Because authority cannot be taken, it can it only can be given. So let's continue. Mm. Your lives light up the world. Let others see your light from a distance. For how can you hide a city that stands in a hilltop? 
Can they see from a distance who you are? Can they see your light? Because most of the time we tell people, come here, look. <laughs> we want to show them from close because we're not able to, because our light is not bright enough to shine. <laughs> so they have to get very close to us in order to see something. Your light light up the world. Let's let others see your light from a distance. How can you hide a city that stands on a hilltop? And who would, would light a lamp and then hide it in an obscure place? Instead, it's a place where everyone in the house can benefit from its light. So don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly before others so that the commendable things you do will shine as light upon them and then they will give their praise to your Father in heaven. Light is, is, is given to us or we become light so that people can see us from afar so that we don't have to be hidden so that we don't have to hide uh, and, uh, from the things that we do. It says that when, when, when light comes into our life, it's simply because God is ready to display us. Yeah. Nobody lights a lamp and then hides it. Instead, it is placed in a place where everyone can see it and everybody benefits from it. So when God decides to, to open up the mind of somebody and creates transformation in their lives and puts them under authority and then the light is, 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 is lit in them is so that everybody can see them, so that everybody can have a, a model, a point of contact with God. Because there are people that I'm not going to be able to touch that you need to touch. Amen. So you need to be able to come here and be lit up so Amen. that you can become a light, so that you can touch the people that can see you but can't see me. Amen. One single light. I want to I go back to this. 14. Your lives light up the world. Let others see your light from a distance. How can you hide a city that stands on a hilltop. I don't, I don't know, and check this out, and, and I want you guys to pay attention to this. I don't know how many of you, and I think that many of us have already done this. I don't know if you guys have gone like to Big Bear or to a mountain hill, and then you come down that hill, and the first thing that you see is all these lights. Right. It's not one light. A lot of them. It's a whole bunch of lights, and all of these lights is what makes the city. It's, it's what allows you to see the entire city. It is not one light that allows you to see the entire city. It's when you come down, you see every single light in that city on that you are able to understand it's a shining city. So God comes and he brings you into the church, not so that the pastor can have light, because even though I have light, uh, we need to light up everybody in the church so that everybody can see the light of the church. The problem is that when we that when we when we come and we look at the church from the outside in, we only see a light. But where are where are all the other lights that give testimony that the church is present? Where is everybody else? Uh, you know, when we look, that's what he says. How can you hide a city? How can you hide the church if everybody is lit? How can you hide the church if everybody's light is on? When, when somebody from the darkness comes to that valley and comes down and he looks at the church and he sees everybody on, they know they're coming to a place that there's light. But how does it look when you're going through the mountain and the only thing that you see is one little light in the darkness? You don't want to visit that place. Because there's only one light there. <laughs> so God, it, it, He doesn't want to light up one big light. We have the concept that, that you light a light, now everybody see. No, no, What God wants is He wants to be able to light up everybody. And then when everybody comes together, right. then everybody can see the light right. around. Right. He wants to bring revelation and knowledge to everybody so that when we all come together and we unite, now they can see the city that is lit up, and now you know that you're coming into a place of progress. 
You're coming into a place of creativity. You're coming into a place of movement. Right. You're coming right. into a place where there are people that, 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 that are advancing or doing something. Why? Because of the lights that you see. So when, when I go up and, and I come back and we see the entire light, we, we see the entire rally, and we see all the buildings and we see all the lights on and then we see all the street lights and everything, they're like, oh, there's a city. Or we're coming down a hill, we see two, three lights, and they're like, oh, that might be a town. What is that? Right. Maybe a house in the middle of nowhere. Go and down. the first thing that we think is like, what is he doing in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> There's nothing going on there. Right. So God wants to raise up a light so that everybody can see. He doesn't want us to hide. He wants us to come together and be lit up so that everybody can see us. So don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly before others so that the commendable things you do will shine as light upon them. And then they will give their praise to your heavenly Father in heaven. Basically, when you come and you have light, the things that you do will cause people to give praise. So Jesus will go out into the town and he will heal a person and then people will start praising God. He will bring people out of captivity. People will praise God. He will uh, uh, lift a curse or a burden for people. People will start praising God. The light comes so that people can see your work. And when you work, the first thing that they're going to do is going to praise God because of what you're doing. So the question is, do people praise God for what they're doing? Or do they just congratulate you? They didn't congratulate Jesus. They praised God for what he was doing. Because they're like, we have never seen nobody do the things that you're doing. We've never seen nobody with the authority uh, uh, that, that you have. So when Jesus was come there, his light would shine in the darkness and the people would praise God by the things and the commendable things that he would do. So the question is, what commendable things are you doing that are causing God, that are causing people to praise God? That also reveals your light. Now, John 8, 12 says this. Then Jesus said, I am the light to the world, and those who embrace me will experience life-giving light, and they will never walk in darkness. To live like this is all the more urgent, for time, for time is running out, and you know, and you know it, is, it is a strategic hour in human history. It is time for us to wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Mm. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and those who embrace me will experience life giving, life giving light, and they will never walk in darkness. So if Jesus is the life giving light, and if he is the one who gives us the light, he says that those that come to him will never walk, walk in darkness. How is it possible that there is darkness in us if he already gave us light? Could it be possible that we don't have light? Because Jesus says, I am the light of the world and those who embrace me. That is the key. Embrace me. What is embrace? Those who cling to something. Not those that just see from afar. <clears throat> so Jesus is saying, those that embrace me will experience life giving light. And they will never walk in the darkness. And then Romans 13, 11 says these words. To live like this, it is a more urgent. It is more urgent today to live in the light, to walk in the light, to experience Christ than it has ever been in any human history before us. For time is running out and you know it is a strategic hour in human history. It is time for us to wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Night's darkness is dissolving away as a new day of destiny dawns. So we must once and for all strip away all that is done in the shadows of darkness, removing it like filthy clothes, and once and for all, we clothe ourselves with the radiance of light as our weapon. We are living in a strategic moment in time. We are living in the time of the kingdom. It is something that has not been lived before. There is more light, more revelation available now than there has ever been in any 
moment in history. It is a strategic hour in human history. So it is time for us to wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And he says, night's darkness is dissolving away as a new day of destiny dawns. So we, will, so we must so we must once and for all strip away what is done in the shadows of darkness, removing it like filthy clothes. That's why I don't understand people that refuse to remove the things that they do in darkness and how they cling to this concept that... Uh, that they have no control over it because they're living in a flesh body. Mm. And here we have a commandment from God and it says that we have to strip away all that is done in the shadows of darkness and, and remove it like filthy clothes. And then we have to clothe ourselves with the radiance of light as our weapon. Why? Because when you have revelation, when your mind is open, your heart is open, and you have the knowledge of Christ, it is a weapon that can destroy all the evil lies of the enemy, all the evil lies of the culture, all the evil lies of the current, all the evil lies that you have been trained to believe. Why? Because the radiant light of God uh, comes to reveal to us the truth. We don't have to live in the darkness. We don't, we don't have to abide and do the, the deeds uh, uh, of darkness, of ignorance anymore. We are to remove it like filthy clothes. And then it tells us in Romans 13, 13, we must live honorably, surrounded by the light of this new day, not in the darkness of drunkenness or debauchery. What is debauchery? Immorality. Partying, drunkenness, fornication, uh, you name it. So it says, not in the darkness of drunkenness and debauchery, not in promiscuity and sensuality, not being argumentative or jealous of others. Argumentative. Because there are people that love to argue, man. Even about the Bible. You can't sit with somebody from another denomination without arguing. <laughs> well, my pastor says this. Well, my pastor says that. But what does the Bible say? I don't know, but my pastor says. <laughs> Where did your pastor get this information from? I don't know, but my pastor says. And we're like, no, but the Bible says this. And the Bible says this. And the Bible says this. And they're argumentative. They love to argue. Wasting my time and your time and everybody's time with arguments that are meaningless. They live in darkness. So they say that they, you know, they, they're, they're not surrounded by the light. Um, they're surrounded by darkness. And that's why they live in drunkenness. Man. There is so much that I can say just in, with drunkenness itself. Because drunkenness uh, is one of those things that, that does not allow your, you to think clearly. Amen. As a matter of fact, there, there's a saying in the world that there are only two people that tell the truth. The people that are drunk and the children. Because when you're drunk, you tell people how you really feel. When you're drunk, you have the nerve to tell the sister, man, you know what? I've been looking at you for all these years. <laughs> and, but today, you look special. <laughs> I don't mean no disrespect, but I just want you to know that you look good. <laughs> <laughs> when you're drunk, the stuff that you're hiding within you comes out. And it overflows. And then the next day, you're like, oh my God, did I really do that? I'm like, you really did that? <laughs> but I didn't mean it. No, you did mean it. Right. It was hidden. Mm. I'm glad I got to see it. Mm. Because that's who you are. <laughs> so it says, not in the darkness of drunkenness and debauchery, 
Not in promiscuity. What is promiscuity? When you have multiple sex partners. And I think, you know, when we speak to the church and we speak to the people, we gotta, we got to speak to them in plain English. Yeah. Because people believe that the Bible doesn't touch this stuff. If you have multiple sex partners, you're living a life of sin and life of darkness, and you need to repent and abandon that darkness. You can't even say that you're a Christian or a believer or that Jesus Christ is your Lord. You need to repent. You need to accept Him. Because you cannot say that He is your Savior, your King, or your Lord if you're in drunkenness, if you're in debauchery, if you're in promiscuity, or sensuality. What is sensuality? When we go, you know, nowadays they call them selfies. <laughs> it's when you go to the mirror and your mirror is your best friend. When you look at yourself this way, you look at yourself this way, then you look at yourself this way, and you figure out which picture I'm going to put out there because none of the ones are going to get the most likes. Sensuality. And you know what's the worst part about sensuality nowadays? Uh, that we have homosexuals teaching women how to be sensual. I always, I know people are not going to like me, but, but in all honesty, we have homosexuals, you know, we, we have a, a what, what is this, a, man, I'm trying to think about it, like this makeup thing. Makeup artist. Like the what? Makeup artist. Yeah, like makeup artists or whatever, but there's a whole industry of, of, of makeup artists, whatever. Do you know that it's dominated by homosexuals? Homosexuals dominate a, an area that is supposed to be for women. Homosexuals are teaching women how to, to uh, put on their makeup. Homosexuals are teaching women how to be sensual. Homosexuals are teaching women how to please men. Darkness. So I always tell people, where did you learn that? Who taught you to paint yourself that way or to put that type of makeup? Where did it come from? Oh, it's just an art form. No, it's wickedness, it's evil, it's debauchery, it's sensuality, it's promiscuity, it's darkness. And we have to, and we have to be light. We cannot be able to, to, to think that light and light have something in common. They have nothing in common. So we have to re-evangelize people and we have to tell people, hey, you know what, you can't have a homosexual telling, mentoring you. How to sleep with your husband. How to, how to make him happy in bed. How to have sex with him. These people are immoral, impure. These people are perverted, deviants. And those are the people that you're listening to. You know what I'm saying? I know people are not going to like me for it, but people don't like to teach the word anymore. People don't. People are like to let me teach you how to become a leader. Let me teach you how to become prosperous. Let me teach you how to how to whatever house the seven angels of God camp around your side. But they don't tell you that the way to do that is by being obedient to God and not practicing drunkenness, not practicing debauchery, not practice promiscuity and sensuality. As a matter of fact, if I'm going to talk about drunkenness, you know that a lot of people uh, have have homosexual tendencies, and when they're drunk, they come out. I'm a man as long as I'm sober. But if, but if me and you drink together, you know, I start seeing you different. You're kind of cute now. <laughs> you know, I like your skinny jeans. It, 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 it makes your uh, rear end look kind of good. Can you go get me another beer so I can watch you walk back and forth? <laughs> Drunkenness. What can I say? I mean, <laughs> believe me or not, if there is at least one reason why you shouldn't get drunk, it's simply, simply so that you won't experience homosexuality. If there's at least one reason, because I've I've heard stories 
of people that have done things drunk. And then they tell them, don't tell anybody that this happened. Let's forget that it happened. And then you go home to your wife and they ask you, hey, what, what is, why are you scratched up from your lip? It was la barba del otro guy. It was, it was the mustache, the, you know, and he was like, Shh. because you got drunk with him. <laughs> so, it, so it tells us, you must live honorably, surrounded by the light of this new day, not in the darkness of drunkenness and debauchery, not in promiscuity or sensuality, not being argumentative or jealous of others. Instead, fully immerse yourselves into the Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, and don't waste even a moment's thought on your former identity to awaken its selfish desires. Uh. You know, God has rescued everybody from a dark place. There is nobody that hasn't done something that is shameful. There is nobody that has not done something that they regret they shouldn't have done. And if God has rescued you, has forgiven you, has cleansed you of your sin, has forgotten them, don't go back to practice those shameful things again. We must live honorable, honorably, surrounded by the light. And I want to stay here. I don't know. The Spirit is just keeping me here. It's like I don't even like talking about this stuff. You know, sometimes my wife, uh, she's like, Alton, just move on from there. <laughs> but sometimes the Spirit just keeps me in a place, and I'm like, I want to move on. But we need to be able to shine light in the darkness and for, so that people can be able to to just walk out of there. You know, we, it's, like I said, there's a lot of stuff, and, and the reason, the reason the church, or the true church of Jesus Christ is going to be hated in the near future is because of the preaching of truth. It's because of the preaching of the light. As we speak right now, there are laws being passed to make sure that you don't get this information. As we speak, there are laws being passed in our government by homosexuals, by the, by the LGBT, by people that, that are confused in their mind, that people that live in darkness, that don't, they don't want nobody to know that this is evil, and they want everybody to believe that this is normal behavior. And they want everybody to believe that this is not darkness, that this, that this is just, uh, they were born this way, and that we should just accept it and move on and leave them alone. So they're passing laws where they're now going to make it uh, complicated for the church to speak the truth because they're saying that it's considered hate speech. And if the church doesn't grow a pair, Sorry, I know you're not used to hearing this from a pulpit. If they, do, if they don't grow one, they're going to be trampled upon because their saltiness cannot be given back to them. They need to be able to come and understand that the times that we're living is a strategic hour in human history where the darkness has united against the church. And the true church cannot stay silent to the truths spoken by our king. So I, it's not that I want to speak against homosexuality or lesbianism or transgender. It's not that I want to speak against drunkenness, promiscuity, uh, sensuality. It's not that I, that I want to speak on those things because uh, I'm trying to bash people. I'm trying to warn people that are living in this condition that this condition is going to lead them to a place of damnation and it is going to keep them in darkness and never ever be able to experience the true light of true light of Christ. But most importantly, I, I want to be able to warn the body of Christ about the strategic hour that faces us. Because if we don't speak the truth, 
If we don't become the light, if we don't expose the darkness, then it might mean that we are part of the darkness ourselves. As, as I speak, like I said, um, they are passing laws here in California throughout the nation. And one of these days, they're going to say the church can no longer speak that being a homosexual is a sin. The church can no longer speak that being transgender uh, is wrong. The church can no longer speak that marriage is, is between a man and a woman. They're trying to change the definitions of everything. They're trying to silence the church. And they're trying and they're, they're trying to get us to agree with darkness. But like, like I said, I, I ain't here um, bashing on the LGBTQ. No. It's like, you're not going to enter the kingdom anyway. So I'm not here trying to bash you to convince you of it. But you can't deprive me of my rights to speak the truth because of my allegiance to Jesus Christ. I have to. So we have to not be able to uh, come here uh, and teach the church to be able to be the light so that they, be, they can be able to speak the truth of what God says it's true because of the time that we're speaking if we can't speak the truth and be the light now while well, the light is still out right. what's going to happen when darkness fills the earth Jesus Christ put it this way you must work while there is light I am the light of the world because the night is coming and when darkness fills the earth nobody's going to be able to work there will be a time where we won't be able to congregate here anymore. There will be a time where churches are no longer going to be able to be open. Maybe the time is not now, but the time is coming. But if we don't practice being light now, what is going to happen when darkness comes over the entire earth? Let me read you these verses and I'm going to end it there. This is the life-giving message we hear him share, and it's still ringing in our ears. We now repeat his words to you. God is pure light. You will never find even a trace of darkness in him. This is why we have to be able to make a decision who we follow, where our faith is, where our allegiance is. Because if our allegiance is to Christ, it says that this is the life-giving message we heard him share. And this is still ringing in our ears. So we now repeat his words to you. It is not a message that I'm making up. It is not a standard that I'm bringing up. I am simply repeating to you a message that I heard him share. A message that is ringing in my ear. So now I only repeat to you his words. God is pure light. You will never find even a trace of darkness in him. Now listen to this. If we claim that we share life with him, but keep walking in the realm of darkness, we're fooling ourselves and not living the truth. Just in case you thought I was making it. If you want to go find it for yourself, 1 John 1, 5, 6, and 7. Read it for yourselves. But if we keep living... In the pure light that surrounds him, we share unbroken fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin. This is not the time to be fooling ourselves anymore. If we claim we share life with him, but we keep walking in the realm of darkness, we're fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. This is not a moment in time where we can come here and pick and choose the denomination that we want to serve. This is not the moment in time or the, the strategic moment in time where we can pick and choose which uh, verses we like and we don't like. This is not the moment in time. Uh, 
where we can just come here and, and, and claim Jesus Christ and continue to practice homosexuality. It's not possible. Christ would be alive if that was the case. Just in, just in case you guys didn't know, like I said, I'm not picking on homosexuals. I, I'm just, for whatever reason, the spirit keeps on giving that, but I'm not picking on them. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to mention them. But there is a, 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 a secretary, the Secretary of Transportation, I believe. Uh, he was also a presidential candidate. I'm not going to mention his name, but he is a Christian. According to him. And he lectured Christians from a national stage. And he told Christians how God how the love of God works. And he lectured Christians on how to follow Christ and how to be Christ-like. And he is a homosexual. He is married to another man. And he is lecturing the church. On how to be like. And then we hear the Bible, and the Bible says if we claim that we share life with Him, but keep walking in the realm of darkness, we're fooling ourselves and not living the truth. We, we now repeat His words to you God is pure light, you will never find even a trace of darkness in Him. So now we have a whole bunch of Christians listening to a homosexual Christian that is practicing homosexuality every single day, teaching you about who God is. A form of godliness, but he's full of impurities and perversion. Oh, no, 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 brother, no, don't, don't talk about a fellow believer. He's not a believer. He's darkness. Because God is pure light and you will never find a trace of darkness in Him. And if you can't find a trace of darkness in Christ and we were called to be the light uh, and we were called to share life with Him but we keep on walking in darkness, we're fooling ourselves. So we have to now tell the church, why are you following people that are walking in darkness and allowing them to teach you about God? It is foolishness. And it is unfortunate, but I, I have to, as a minister of the kingdom, as a minister of life, I have to be able to be able to address these things because they're coming. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't even say they're coming. They're here. They're already in your face, and you voted for them. But if we keep living in the pure light that surrounds him, we share unbroken fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, continually cleanses us of every sin. So if we want the blood of Jesus to keep cleansing us of every sin, we need to keep living in the pure light that surrounds him. We need to abandon all traces of darkness in us and walk in the light of God. We can't continue to fool ourselves. That's what we will find in a church of 20,000 people and a church of four people. Because you know, nowadays, and I'm going to end it with this, um, we live in a time where everything is to be trendy. Right. Where, where your pastor has to wear the latest apparel has to look a certain way to appeal to people uh, so that he can look cool so that he can uh, uh, he can what? Attract. Attract? Attract. Oh, attract. Attract. So that he can attract. And we see churches that are multi-million dollar churches that have gifted pastors that have been fired for adultery. 
that have been fired because they were practicing immorality, homosexuality within the church walls. Paid pastors. And we have to open our eyes to the truth that darkness and light have nothing in common. Anointing and being called by God to preach His gospel has nothing, 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 nothing to do by the way that you dress. By being cool or being popular or being trendy, uh, none of those things. Because I see the model of John the Baptist and the model of Jesus Christ where it says that John the Baptist was a voice calling out in the desert, the middle of nowhere. And he was given a message of repentance, baptizing people. And the next thing that I hear or that I read is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brought other brought all the people to him. It wasn't because they turned the church into a club. It wasn't because of the lighting. It wasn't because uh, you know of his social media following it was the Holy Spirit and nowadays because of social media we look at the uh, we look at churches based on how cool they are right. and based on how trendy the pastor is instead of seeing how much light they're, ra they're really radiating from their book so I tell all of you guys that are listening. Don't fool yourselves. If you keep walking in the realm of darkness. You are not living in the truth. Father in the name of Jesus Lord. I just want to thank you. For the opportunity that you have given me to be here today Lord. To be able to preach your word be able to expose the darkness it's not a popular message it's not a message uh, to gather amens and hallelujahs and praise to your name but it is a message of confrontation because there is no unity between the light and the darkness we pray and I pray that you bring out the revelation and the understanding so that people can come back into the light and can come back to the first love that they had with you at the very beginning. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Go ahead again and just give God some praise for that powerful word that he's going to bless us with it today. Uh, <laughs> so we are going to end in the service of collecting offering, collecting tithes, the seeds of honor. Um, yeah, because here at House 633, again, we teach people to give to God out of honor, never out of manipulation or to even expect anything in return. Um, just to simply honor God for what he's done in our lives, for what he's going to do, and simply so he can get closer to us. Because the principle of honor is that, that whatever you honor gets closer to you, and whatever you dishonor gets further away from you. So if you're ready, go ahead and bow your heads, close your eyes. If this word has blessed you, you can give online at honorseed at house633.com through Zell. So thank you, Father God, for this word that you've given us, Lord. We just thank you for every seed that is being planted into your kingdom, Father God. We thank you for every person that's planting their seeds into this house, Father God. We just pray that you bless them, Father God. Thank you for their hearts, Father, because you have given people a heart of generosity, Lord. And you bring people's hearts closer to you, Father. So we just pray, Lord, that every seed that's planted, Lord, may it grow and be fertile. Father God, may it grow and produce fruit, Father, 30, 60, and 100 fold, Lord. We just pray that we be good stewards of everything that you put into our lives, Father God. We don't want ownership of everything, Lord, because we know that you are our Lord. You are our King, Father, and you provide every single need, Lord. We just want to be good stewards of everything you've deposited into our lives, Father. We love you, and we just want to keep seeking your kingdom and its righteousness so that everything else can be added on into our lives. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. We thank you, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. To the King.